Hello, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Helen Soslowski. I'm the events director for Oblong Books in New York's Hudson Valley. If you have questions at any time during this program, please type them in the chat or in the Q&A that you'll find at the bottom of the screen. And they'll be addressed at the end of the conversation portion of tonight's program. We're very pleased this evening to welcome Megan Kate Nelson, who is joining us to talk about her book, Saving Yellowstone a grand narrative of, of adventure and exploration, and also a story of indigenous resistance, the expansive reach of railroad photographic and publishing technologies, and the struggles of black southerners to bring racial terrorists to justice. Saving Yellowstone is published by Scribner, it's out this month and available in both our stores and online through oblongbooks.com. Megan Kate Nelson is a writer and a historian living in Lincoln, Massachusetts. Her books include The Three Cornered War, Ruin Nation, and Trembling Earth. And she's written about the Civil War, US Western history, and American culture for the New York Times, The Washington Post, Smithsonian Magazine, Preservation Magazine, and Civil War Monitor. She holds a BA in history and literature from Harvard University and earned her PhD in American Studies from the University of Iowa. She has taught at Texas Tech, Cal State Fullerton, Harvard and Brown University. Conducting the conversation with Megan this evening is Alex Wolfe. Alex Wolfe is the conservation scientist for the Regional Land Trust and Environmental Advocacy Organization, Scenic Hudson. With a background in wildlife ecology and conservation, He's worked around the country in some of our nation's most remote and storied national parks and wildernesses, including a season studying amphibians in Yellowstone National Park. His current work focuses on the intersection of natural resources and community resilience in the face of climate change in Hudson Valley. Welcome to you both. It's a pleasure to have you with us this evening and Alex, I'll hand it off to you. Okay, thank you very much, Helen, for hosting and having us. Um, Megan, it's, it's so nice to have the opportunity to chat with you this evening. Um, I, I just finished reading the book earlier. Here it is. Um, I recommend it. Hopefully everybody can see that okay. And, and um, like I said, it's just lovely to have a chance to chat with you about this. Um, as Helen said, I've, I've worked in Yellowstone, and I actually had the privilege of also working in the Great Okefenokee Swamp, uh, now a National Wildlife Refuge in, in southern Georgia. Um, and I was sort of curious, uh, as somebody who, who writes about things like the Civil War, what, what draws you to writing about wildernesses and about these two places in particular? That is such a great question. And thank you, Alex, for being here with me. Um, I've been looking forward to this conversation because I, I often talk to a lot of historians, but I have not yet had a chance to talk to um, a conservation scientist. And so that's it's very, very cool for me um, to get your perspective and to chat with you about this. And thank you to Oblong for hosting us this evening. Uh, really, really wonderful. Um, I think that from the beginning of my life as a historian, I've always been interested in different kinds of landscapes. And quite frankly, the, the stranger, the better, right? So, so my first book was about swamps. Then I wrote about ruins. Um, you know, the third book, Three Cornered War is about deserts. Uh, and then I, I went to Yellowstone to this great geothermal basin and super volcano. So, um, and I think the reason for that is that, uh, you know, growing up, I would go on these summer car trips with my family. And because my mother was not a fan of flying, so we would pile into the car and we would take these two week, usually uh, road trips across the United States. And so I really gained a sense because we would stop at historic sites and museums in addition to national parks and, and forests and other kinds of sites across the US, um, I developed a kind of interest in history through the landscape, through looking at the landscape and kind of moving through it. Um, so I don't know how you, uh, kind of developed your interest in science and in, in nature and wilderness. But I think that had a, a very large role to play for me. Um, and then also I, I grew up in Colorado. Um, my mother's side of the family had uh, a series of cabins in the mountains and we would go there uh, in the summer, usually once a week, sometimes for weekends and would always go hiking. 
And I had an aunt who was a big birder and my grandmother and her sisters always just seemed to know various interesting facts about wildlife. And so, you know, I spent these really joyous moments out in nature, um, hiking around and kind of moving through it and observing things. And all of that drove me to the study of history in place. Um, and, and yeah, and I just, I like these places that many people might not think of as particularly beautiful. Um, they might think of them also as somewhat threatening. I mean, I think, I mean, I, since you've done work in the Okefenokee too, I don't know if you see, you know, looking at both the Okefenokee and Yellowstone, how they share that, that sense that there's something going on underneath the surface, you know, the, the deeply tannic waters of the Okefenokee that you can't see through. Uh, you don't know how deep the water is. And then the peat uh, is so deep and squishy. And, and it, it has that sort of element to it um, that Yellowstone has, where you can really sense all of the molten activity going on kind of underneath your feet. Uh, and it, there is a thrill there, but also kind of a, a sense of danger, which I think draws a lot of people uh, into, into the midst of these amazing places. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's such a great point and one I hadn't really thought about, but I think they're both just such dynamic places and you can see change happening before your eyes. Yes. Stone, you see geologic change happening, and in, in Okefenokee, you see biological change happening um, as, as peat mats float up and plants seed on them, and you sort of see new land being formed before your eyes. Um, and so there is that, that dynamism as well as, I think, sort of the unknown. Um, and there, there are also both places, you know, I, I went into wildlife biology for a love of animals, um, and both of these places have large, large animals, right? <laughs> and animals that you don't often experience in much of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, that probably adds, adds an element to it as well. Yeah. The charismatic megafauna, right? The, we, we've got the gators in the swamp. And then, I mean, Yellowstone just has all the big ones, right? It has the bison and the moose and the wolves and the bears and it's just, and the elk, mm -hmm. just incredible. And, and yeah. in fact, I mean, this was one of the things that surprised me when I was reading through Hayden's notes and other members of the survey's notes. They didn't really talk about animals all that much. Um, they, they were not there, I think, in the right season to really see any large uh, herds of buffalo. They, mm -hmm. you know, if they saw any kind of deer or elk, they were more interested in shooting them for food uh, than they were in collecting them. Um, although Spencer Baird, who was the head of the Smithsonian at the time, who had you know, sent a lot of equipment with Hayden and they had a very good and longstanding relationship and he was looking forward to getting a lot of specimens and he wanted the skulls of animals, um, you know, and the skins right. of amphibians right. and tiles. And he wanted all of that for the collections. Um, but they did, but they really didn't mention animals all that often or really running into any uh, of those herds that we think of and associate so much with Yellowstone now, uh, which is kind of fascinating. Yeah, it's always been interesting to me that, you know, when I tell somebody to go go to Yellowstone, it's, you know, it's the American Serengeti, right? It's where you can go on safari in the U.S. and see all of these huge, huge animals. Mm -hmm. The park was originally conserved not for wildlife, but for the geology of the place. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Whereas, you know, the Okefenokee was saved for birds. That was the main argument, right? So, and, and there are other national parks that are saved specifically for the wildlife within them. But yeah, you're absolutely right. It was about protecting the geothermal features. That was the, the outstanding, unique, special element of them um, and not any, you know, hooved animals or any other kinds of animals <laughs> wandering around the park at that time. Yeah. It was interesting to me too, you talked about, um, you know, several, several people in the book mentioned Niagara Falls. Yes. And already by the 1870s, they felt that it had been, that, that Niagara Falls had been spoiled by, you know, basically becoming a tourist trap and being over peopled and, and having too many sort of profiteers there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as sort of, I was surprised that that sentiment was already there in the 1870s. 
Yeah, the, and Niagara was one of these places that was both a great national icon and by the early 1870s, a real eyesore. Yeah, and it was, a, and I think a cautionary tale for particularly a lot of politicians uh, and anyone mm -hmm. who's interested in the wilderness idea and you know wanting to preserve a space and keep it out of the hands of entrepreneurs they believe to be you know common and uh, kind of tacky and you know they were fine with passing the Yellowstone Act which provides for the building of roads and other forms of infrastructure to bring tourists into the park but they did not want it open to all of that development. And it was already, it already had some, some hint of that because you know, Hayden turned up the Gardner River thinking that he was the first white man to do so. And he found a bunch of miners there taking the waters <laughs> and, and two men who had already, who told them that they had already, were about to file a preemption claim and that they were going to build a hotel. And he was like, this is not good. This is not fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was it was interesting to me to to read about this the Hayden expedition and as they're leaving Salt Lake City and going into you know the wilderness to explore, and they're stopping at ranches and they're getting fed by ranchers and there's miners everywhere and you know there are already a lot of as you as you say there are already a lot of people there mm -hmm. and and so the concept of wilderness. Um, and this is something that in, in conservation science circles is being discussed a lot these days, um, and, and more and more so since I think 2020. And the idea that, you know, some people are now saying that the idea of, of American wilderness is actually racist because it ignores the fact that there were people here before Europeans got here. You know, wilderness is the concept of empty land, but the land was most certainly not empty. Um, so I, I'd be curious to, to hear your take on that, whether you think sort of the term of wilderness is antiquated or is there still a role for that idea in, in our modern discourse? Yeah, I mean, I think environmental historians have been talking about this problematic element of wilderness for a while. And especially in this um, kind of canonical essay by William Cronin called The Trouble with Wilderness. And that, because it does, it erases, first of all, thousands of years of indigenous presence and use and land stewardship. Uh, and then also other forms of use, um, because you're exactly right in that chapter, which is called Wilderness of People, um, <laughs> the Hayden uh, survey is, is on this very long stage road uh, from Salt Lake City to Virginia City, Montana, and it's just, you know, Mormon ranchers and uh, U.S. Army troops stationed at forts and um, Shoshone Bannock peoples, uh, some on reservation, some off reservation. And they're just, you know, they are being supplied along the way. And this is very helpful for them in this first part of the survey uh, to have that kind of ability to trade, uh, the ability to have people in the area. So they're not striking out into this great empty vastness, right? I mean, even though Yellowstone is the one of the last unmapped places on the con, you know, on the, in the United States, really, um, in the continental United States, um, it, it really is surrounded by landscapes that have been inhabited and used and traversed you know, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And so this is a very problematic concept, um, but it is a very sticky concept. You know, the term wilderness, the term frontier, the term pioneer. I mean, all of these terms that we associate most often, I think, with the West, um, you know, that's a region that has uh, the kind of deepest tie to those ideas. Uh, they're really, really sticky. And it's really hard to complicate those terms. And it's really hard to replace those terms. You know, I mean, historians right. have tried to replace frontier with borderlands uh, for many years now. And mm. it, that has worked uh, within academic circles, but it is still not popular, popularly accepted. Um, and in fact, I, in the last class I taught, which was a class on U.S. Western history at Brown in 2014, I had students read uh, the Frontier Thesis by Frederick Jackson Turner and then a, a piece from 
uh, U.S. Western historians arguing for the term borderlands to replace frontier to sort of give us a, a greater sense of the people who are, you know, in contact and colliding in these spaces and, and giving us a more sense of, a, of diversity. And, you know, students read both of them and they appreciated both of them. And then I said, okay, well, what do you think? Frontier or borderlands? And they were like, frontier all the way. And I was yeah. like, what? <laughs> What? <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> but um, so it, I think it remains, you know, really difficult to replace a term like that. But my hope is that we can really start to move toward a, a more complicated notion of wilderness. So that when we think of wilderness now, it's not that pristine, untouched nature idea. Um, but it is something more complicated than that. And, and more of an idea of a landscape that is a site of struggle, that is, mm -hmm. a, you know, a site of, of development in a lot of different kinds of ways, because um, there's such rich histories in these places. Uh, and, you know, I think it's, it's tempting to find the simple narrative that explains those places to us and their significance. But, you know, that's, that really hides, I think, a lot of the, the diversity and the richness and the fullness of that yeah. history. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting you're talking about growing up and sort of hiking through these places and getting getting sort of the interest in place. And for me, I've found that same interest and and my route was through through animals and wildlife and that connection. But as I, you know, sort of trained as an ecologist and learned more, I realized, you know, how much of what we see in, in the quote unquote natural world has been shaped by human activity. Mm -hmm. right? There's no real untouched wilderness and every place has a land use history. Mm -hmm. Shapes what habitats and what wildlife are there currently. Um, so it is, it is a sticky, the hard subject, you know? And it's, it's a, there's a legal definition to wilderness too. Um, right. And, and so places like Okefenokee and Yellowstone have legally designated wilderness that's been designated by the federal government. There are state designated wildernesses that fit very specific criteria, but that's, that's almost totally separate from sort of the, the, the culture, the American culture of wilderness and the place that frontier and wilderness and wild west have, I think, in our sort of natural national ethos. Absolutely, yeah. And that, yeah, it's 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 interesting to think about these places because you'll see, and I think we're starting to see a little bit more because people are traveling more now um, that we're coming out of the mo most recent uh, kind of hunkering down during the pandemic. So I'm starting to see more trip photos, which is great. I love it because I love to travel and I've really missed it. Um, but you'll, you know, I saw someone post a, a photograph of the Grand Canyon, you know, and it's just like, look at this amazing wilderness. And it does, it looks like that, but then you realize, you know, he's taking that photograph from a platform that has been built so he can take that photograph, <laughs> you know? And, and there is this tourist infrastructure that is built to take you to these places so you can experience them in what looks to be an unmitigated <laughs> way, yes. but yeah. it's actually profoundly <laughs> shaped uh, by... Yeah, but... Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say some of my favorite pictures are, you know, whether it's Yellowstone or, or Smoky Mountains National Park or wherever, you know, I have pictures of a, a bear, say, mm -hmm. and I pan a little bit over and you can see the 50 other tourists lined <laughs> next to me also taking pictures of the bear. That's right. You see those, you see those on safaris too, right? Yep. Where it's like, oh, look at this majestic cheetah just sitting here, you know, washing itself. And then you pan over and just hundreds of trucks and people just taking photos and, you know, um, and you know that everyone is going to post that picture as if it is, right. oh, here is this pure animal in this pure wilderness space when in reality we are all part of that experience. Um, and that it's also really interesting to me and it was interesting to read through Hayden's accounts and, um, and also Albert Peel's accounts, which were just amazing of the, of the expedition in 71. And, you know, they, they kind of are saying, now we're going into this, you know, unknown land and now we're going to go do this. And, the, and they're like, so we followed the trail. 
like, <laughs> um, yeah, no, not unknown. Uh, you are in fact following indigenous pathways, uh, which themselves are following usually pathways pounded out by animals, right? Because they are um, all living beings move through the landscape in the way that is easiest, right? You don't want to have, you know, you don't take the hardest route usually. You're searching right. for the easiest route to water or to to wherever you're going, and so that, of course, I was like, well, that's classic explorer, you know, language that they are, they are the they are the first ones, and yet. No, they are not. Um, and then to go there, uh, my husband and I went on a, a trip to the, the West in September and went to Yellowstone for five days. And when you're on those two loop roads, you're following almost exactly Hayden's path. Wow. Uh, and which is almost exactly indigenous pathways through that region. And that's a really interesting form of kind of layering to me, the sort of, you know, palimpsest of movement through this amazing landscape, um, but it really gives you that sense of that rich history. Um, and I'm, and, you know, I, I don't think I was paying as much as attention as I should have kind of to see if there were signs in Yellowstone kind of making you aware of that fact. Like, I would love to see those, right. Where you're like, you know, you are on this loop road, which is built on part of the yeah. Bannock trail, which is itself uh, built on a trail that bison and elk had had pounded out on the way to the the waters of the Yellowstone, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's that's amazing. I certainly did not realize that that yeah. the loop roads had that history to them when I was out there. Um, yeah, and of course we always, you know, as humans, we forge new paths often, but um, but it is also it is really vivid, and I and I would love, uh, I you know, I wish I had been there so that I could see those original trails. Um, you know, you get a little sense in some of the photographs of William Henry Jackson's where he is taking photos of the surveyors on horseback, and they are all kind of in a line, and they're all in a line because they're following a single the trail. trail. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so there's evidence of it, uh, but I would have loved to have been there before they started building those roads on top of those uh, pathways and kind of obliterated the traces of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you, you just mentioned the, the photographs and it, one of the interesting parts of the book for me was sort of Hayden, the expedition leader, realizes the importance of visuals. And so he, you know, he hires photographers and he hires Moran, the painter, who, you know, is sort of a giant in his own right, um, perhaps because of Hayden hiring him to paint the Yellowstone. Yeah, you know, this is one of Hayden's real elements of genius. And he's, he's such an interesting figure, which is why, I mean, it was very obvious to me he needed to be one of the protagonists in the book because he is the leader of the expedition. He leads the lobbying efforts to get the Yellowstone Act passed. He writes, he even helps to write some of the committee reports uh, that are advocating for the act. And so I, I knew that he had to be, the, you know, a major figure, if not the major figure of the book. And but he also was just really fun to write about because he was one of these guys, you know, he was just really scrappy. He grew up in poverty. He was a child of divorce. He, you know, his brilliance was really kind of obvious to his family. And so they sent him to Oberlin. They managed to send him to college, which is sort of remarkable. And it was there that he, I mean, he kind of floundered a little bit in the beginning, but he sort of ultimately discovered this love of science and really found out about himself that he was a, a really great field scientist. Like he, that's what he really loved. He, he was a good writer also, but he, what he really loved was that time out in the field, the, the travel out to the West. He would go in his early uh, expeditions, he would go by himself or with just one other person and go collecting fossils, which he was also really good at. But once he started to develop this idea about himself that he wanted to be you know, this scientist explorer, he wanted to be uh, well known in the scientific community, which was not really embracing him because he was a little abrasive, he was a little ambitious, he wasn't, you know, he didn't have the genteel sort of aspect of the, the science, most of the scientific community, which was drawn from the elite classes during this time. So he really had to hustle, right, but, um, but he really loved it. And he found out that he was a pretty good writer also. Um, but very early on, he had a sense that 
visual images and particularly photography, which kind of burst onto the American scene in the late 1850s and, and then the 1860s during the Civil War, he, he really knew that photographs in particular were going to be vital to his work because um, they acted in a couple of ways. First, they provided proof uh, because, you know, today we know that photographs can be manipulated. I mean, what is Instagram except abundant proof of that, right? Um, and, uh, but in this moment, uh, most Americans believe that photography showed you truth, that it was a fully accurate rendering of reality. And so for him to have photographs gave him proof that he had discovered all kinds of different elements of the American landscape, which helped him to get more money from the US Congress to fund future expeditions. Um, but then they were also this kind of amazing record of what was actually out there in the West. Um, and he could use them as illustrations in his reports, which he did the basis for illustrations uh, at that point. And he really also found it valuable to have sketch artists who could uh, render fossils and minerals and all kinds of other samples and animals for the reports uh, and topographers. He was a huge believer in maps, uh, which are, you know, a really important way to understand the landscape and what is there. And yeah, and painters. I mean, he, because the, the only drawback, of course, of photography and sketching, uh, sketch art, artistry is that it's in black and white. And so, paintings could give you the color. And so, you know, Moran joins him in July, kind of sent out uh, by Jay Cook and Hayden embraces him because he knows, right? Uh, and, and probably knew him from Philadelphia, knew of him. Um, Moran wasn't yet as famous as he would become, but he was making this name for himself. And William Henry Jackson and Thomas Moran working together just created this phenomenal visual record of the Yellowstone in this moment. And, you know, there had been all of these rumors about what was there. No one was really sure if they were true. Uh, you know, it seemed hard to believe, you know, these cliffs of glass and exploding mud volcanoes and all of these things seemed just kind of insane. But then here they have photographic proof of Old Faithful, you know, going off uh, every hour. And then they have Moran's amazing artwork uh, and his, especially his painting, The Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, which is the, on the cover of the book. And then also readers will, um, there, there's a segment of the book that kind of tracks Moran as he paints what he calls his big picture, uh, because he ultimately sells it to the US Congress for $10,000, which was a sort of unheard of amount of money <laughs> for the government to spend, uh, because they believed it was this uh, just really sublime and effective rendering of one of what was already an iconic landscape in America. Um, but yeah, Hayden knew from the very beginning the visual images were going to be important. And so uh, both Jackson and Moran are kind of uh, not like primary protagonists, but they're definitely supporting actors uh, in this book. Um, and they're interesting guys in their own right. You know, they became really good friends while they were out there on the expedition. Yeah, and it's, it's notable too, you mentioned color and sort of that they needed Moran to paint for the color, which is, which is of course so integral to, I mean, it's how the place got its name, right? But also, you know, for those who haven't been there, you go to the hot springs and there are all these incredible, just kaleidoscope of colors from all these different bacteria living in these hot springs. And it, it really is a place where, you know, photograph, black and white photographs will, will show you something, but you can't quite capture what you can in color. Right. Yeah. And, and, that is, I mean, I don't know if you have this experience when you're at Yellowstone, but it is the the amazing diversity and the array of the colors is just really stunning. And we, I, the funny story that we have about this is that you know Grand Prismatic Spring is an, an iconic place within Yellowstone, and it is often used along with Old Faithful and the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone um, as, the, as sort of an image. Uh, that you're like, you know, you're in Yellowstone when, right? And right. so um, so our big goal was to go to Grand Prismatic Spring. And if you've ever been there, 
the parking lot is tiny. It's incredibly difficult to actually visit if you're there during any kind of, you know, tourist surge. We finally made it in and we went, but we were seeing it from the ground and it was cold. It was in September and it had been snowing and it was really cold. Um, and so all we could see was steam. Like we couldn't see any of the colors and we were like, no, what? So the, so the Grand Prismatic Spring has become our sort of, I don't even know what you would call it. Instead of a um, white whale or something. Yes, that's exactly what it is. So we are in search. And in fact, we're going back in May. Oh, okay. and, and my husband was like, all right, we're going to get up really early one morning. And we're just going to go. And we we figured out that what you have to do is actually take the hike. There's a hike kind of behind from another entrance. And then you kind of see it from above. And then you can see the colors. And he's like, we're going to go. And we're going to see that Grand Prismatic Spring. We're going to do it. Got to see it. <laughs> I know. But this is one of those things, right, where, they, you know, this is a, a very touristy reaction to Yellowstone, to want to see this feature uh, and to feel like your trip maybe wasn't complete if you didn't see the whole thing, right? Um, yeah. and, and, then, and at the same time, you're describing an experience that, you know, they had looked at Niagara Falls and tried to avoid. So right. Too small, you're fighting the crowd. You yes. can't see the thing you can't see. Exactly. You go away disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And and you know, there is a, a question about whether, you know, are we loving this place to death? Like, are there too many people? Um, you know, Yellowstone has a very short, full tourist season. I mean, you can still go in the winter. There are some, you know, and the northern entrance and I think the northeast entrance are open. So you can kind of go along that corridor, um, which must be just outrageously beautiful and so fun in the winter time. Um, but most people visit Yellowstone between May and late August, basically early September. And that's 4 million people in that short yeah. amount of time, which is a lot of people. It's a million yeah. people a month and on only, you know, two big loop roads and they're just two lanes. So yeah. one, one of my strongest memories, unfortunately, is, is the traffic. Yeah. 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 I mean, and, uh, you know, when I first went in 1982 with my family, that is one of the, when I was starting to write this book and I was kind of thinking back on that experience, one of the things that I remember is pulling over on the side of the road in the car to like stare at some bison or something. Right. <laughs> but this was like one of my dominant memories was a car memory. Yeah, very <laughs> you know? much so. Yeah, but it's, okay. it's a very large you know, it's not the largest national park in the nation, but it is, I think, in the top 10. And it yeah. is, a, a, you know, big, big landscape. And you have to basically do it by car. I would love to be able to do it by bike, actually. If I could, mm -hmm. they just close down the roads and you could just bicycle. That would be, That'd so be great. Cool. And, that it, would and be it may cool. happen as we, you know, the, we're, we're loving the place to death. You know, it's happened at Zion National Park in Yosemite where they're starting to have you know, limit traffic, have shuttles, et cetera, because the, the traffic is just so bad and it affects people's experiences. So hopefully, yeah, yeah exactly. Keep finding those solutions for and do it for Yellowstone as well. Yeah. So, and transportation is key. I think we're, we're getting a, a, um, a question from the chat to talk a little bit about the role that um, the Northern Pacific Railroad played in the exploration of, of Yellowstone. Um, yeah, and this is, <clears throat> this was key, right? There was no, um, there were only between about 500 and 1,000 visitors every year uh, in, from 1872 to 1883, because there was no good way to get to Yellowstone. Um, but in 1883, the Northern Pacific Railroad was finished. Um, and finally, people started to come in much larger numbers because they could actually get there. Uh, because the, right. one of the reasons that uh, it was not fully explored by Americans until 1871 is that it was so hard to get there. And really, Hayden was only able to launch his, um, his expedition because of the, the Transcontinental Railroad. He was able to take that railroad line, get out to Salt Lake City in about a week, and then move north. Um, and again, because of that short window that he had, 
it wasn't really possible to get into the park and do any kind of serious exploring or specimen collecting um, until that piece of technology was there. And Jay Cook, who is one of the, so there are three main protagonists in the book, Hayden and Jay Cook, and then Sitting Bull, the Hunkpapa Lakota chief. And Jay Cook was very interested in Hayden's expedition uh, and in Yellowstone because he, in 1870, had taken over the financing of the Northern Pacific Railroad, which was meant to be the second transcontinental. It was meant to extend from the Great Lakes uh, all the way to the Pacific coast of Oregon. And uh, they were really looking for, they had already started to build the track kind of from both ends, but there was this big chunk in the middle uh, from the Missouri River to the Yellowstone Basin uh, that had not been surveyed yet. And so, Cook wanted to know what Hayden found there. Uh, and he also uh, was very interested in the visual images that especially Thomas Moran was going to produce because one thing that Hayden and Jay Cook shared uh, was an interest in visual images. Uh, Jay Cook was in, you know, a math genius. He had a head for business, grew up in Ohio, moved to Philadelphia uh, to work in a, a banking house and on the eve of the Civil War had founded his own investment bank. And he made a ton of money during the war selling US war bonds to you know, support the, the Union war effort. And after the war ended in this kind of period of turmoil, he was really looking for another national project, something that would give him that patriotic fervor, give him a sense of purpose, and then also make him a bunch of money, right? Uh, he wanted that too. Um, and he found that in the Northern Pacific Railroad. Uh, and most of his compatriots in, in investment banking were just aghast because railroads are not good investments, right? They are horrible. Like you have to, pre in order to um, get any of the government's kind of land subsidies, you have to build track. But to build track, you have to have money. But investors won't give you money without that land. So you have this terrible... Uh, kind of money crunch. And he was having a really hard time uh, getting investors to buy into the Northern Pacific. So he was kind of at a desperate point at this moment. Uh, and he sent out his own survey teams uh, that were leaving from Fort Ellis and Bozeman, sort of north of, of Yellowstone on the West End and then on the East End from the Missouri River. And they were trying to survey a route, uh, which they thought mostly was going to go along the Yellowstone River. And um, they they wanted to just find out and cook wanted to find out if it was if you could run a railroad through this vast territory which in fact belonged uh to the lakota people and so sitting bull was there and he uh, resisted uh, this attempt to cross his land in 71 72 and 73 and surveilled and attacked northern pacific uh, survey teams and so this is a this is a story that doesn't often get told alongside or even in relation to the exploration and preservation of Yellowstone, uh, but is, is very much a part of that story because Hayden and Cook and Sitting Bull in this moment were laying claim uh, to the Yellowstone Basin and then the Yellowstone Valley uh, and really trying to, to assert their rights to this place, um, to own it and to use it in the way that they imagined. Yeah, I was I was surprised um, <clears throat> reading. I think it was one of the surveyors in, in your book. You know, you talk about he's he's going through the valley of the Yellowstone River and he's he's trying to pick where to lay track. And it, you know, there's sort of an offhanded thought of like, oh well, yeah, that you know that land was grant, granted to the Lakota through a U.S. treaty, but we'll just mm -hmm. government to scrub that treaty and then we'll lay our track through, no problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and th that happened all the time. Right, and, and this was a feature of US treaties with indigenous peoples, <clears throat> really going back to the, the 1840s, but especially in all the big treaties of 1868, uh, there was a provision in all of them that yes, this land will be yours for a reservation, but the US government always reserves the right to run a railroad through it. And it, in every single one, this was a line item. And so they knew, the US government knew when they were negotiating these treaties, you know, the transcontinental was about to be completed and they knew that they were gonna want to run other railroad lines through indigenous lands. And that meant 
lands that they were going to force indigenous peoples to give up and then also reservation lands that they were forcing them onto. Um, so yeah, so he, yeah, he's like, oh, this northern bank of the Yellowstone is not going to work. So we're going to need to put it on the southern bank and we'll just, ex we'll just erase that treaty yeah. to, get that, to get that land. And, and the fact that they just believed that to, to be the right way to go and that they were not going to have no problems really indicated what was a common belief uh, in among white Americans in this moment, which is that indigenous people have no land rights that the federal yeah. government is bound to respect. Yeah, striking, you know, and it's sort of, it's something I was, I was aware of, but the, the commonality of it and sort of the almost, it seemed like a blase attitude towards sort of reclaiming land that had been, had been, you know, arranged through treaty to belong to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, and there is an important moment in 1871, which is, again, not a moment that people often talk about either in the history of Reconstruction, um, which we so often talk about as only taking place in the South, um, but has its Western components during this period, um, but also in the history of, of federal uh, U.S. Indian policy. We don't really talk about this moment in 1871 when Congress in an Indian Appropriations Act, which is how they usually, you know, they, they got the money then um, and appropriated the funds to send to Indian agencies across the West uh, to give out uh, to indigenous nations. And they just inserted a writer that said, uh, from this point on, we will uh, abide by the treaties that we have made to this point with uh, tribal nations. But from this point on, there will be no treaties, hmm. which meant they would no longer recognize native sovereignty. Because of course, when you negotiate a treaty, you are negotiating a treaty with a separate people with, right. you are recognizing nation. them as such. Yeah, a different nation. Yeah. And so in that moment, just this little writer, it's just, you know, part of a sentence in this very obscure piece of legislation that's basically about the budget, right? Yeah. Um, the US government changes, it's, it's, Indian policy and, and yeah, commits itself to really, uh, instead of negotiating first and instead of recognizing and respecting native sovereignty, uh, they'll go to warfare first and force native people to accept their terms. So you mentioned, I, I do wanna make sure we have time for audience questions if there are any and, and folks, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. You can see the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen there, I think. Um, but you, you mentioned reconstruction. Mm -hmm. The blurb on, on the cover of the book talks about sort of the, the foundations of Yellowstone and, and how that's sort of connected in time to reconstruction. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Because I think a lot of people don't think of reconstruction when they think of Yellowstone National Park. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, this was um, one of my questions. I actually came to this book topic from the Three Cornered War uh, because they're, one of the protagonists in that book, John Clark, was the Surveyor General of New Mexico Territory. And so I was doing kind of general background research in the history of surveying, ran into this uh, Fernand Hayden survey of 1871, which I'd actually studied in grad school as part of an art history class. And I was like, oh, right, there are these great surveys that are heading out in this period. That's interesting. And realized that its 150th anniversary was coming up, which meant that the there was also going to be the 150th anniversary of the Yellowstone Act, which comes just you know six months after Hayden returns uh, from the Yellowstone. And so I thought, well, this is a great moment, right? I mean, anniversaries are really important moments uh, for historians, for Americans in general to think about why something was important in the past, an event or a place, and then how it has continued to be important kind of since that moment, um, and to really have a reckoning. And then I was also thinking, wait a minute, this is all taking place in 1871, 72, which is right in the middle of Reconstruction, right in the middle of Ulysses S. Grant's first term as president. And, you know, why is Congress bothering to? I mean, they gave Hayden $40,000, which is a lot of money um, to go and survey Yellowstone in this moment where, you know, the nation is still in turmoil. 
still trying to get over the trauma of losing more than 600,000 men in, in field of battle and hospitals um, and would lose hundreds of thousands more uh, to their battle injuries and to, um, to various kind of mental illnesses in the years after the war. You know, the economy was still a little shaky, was having, you know, having trouble writing itself, uh, especially in the South. And then there's this huge epidemic of white violence across the former Confederate states um, because the Republican dominated US Congress had passed the 14th and the 15th amendments, um, you know, providing for citizenship rights uh, for all Americans uh, born and naturalized. And then, and there's an important moment which we can talk about later, an important parenthetical to that, which is accept Indians untaxed. Um, and, uh, and then the 15th amendment giving voting rights uh, to black men and so, white Southerners in the wake of the war are resisting this uh, through state legislation like black codes and then also through these huge waves, waves of violence um, that were kind of most potently symbolized by the acts of the KKK in this moment. So I'm, I was thinking to myself, why when, when the US Congress has this kind of stuff to deal with in the South, um, why are they paying attention to the West? Why are they thinking that Yellowstone is this place, right? Where that is important the, for, for Americans to think about and important for Americans to know about and to understand. Um, and what I figured out in the course of my research is that these two projects, the, the US Congress's attempt to uh, really control the South and to bring those Confederate states back into the Union uh, while also protecting uh, the newly given citizenship rights of Black Americans, um, and then also to kind of wrest control of the West out of the hands of Native people and to bring the West into the Union. Those were kind of twin federal projects that were all about extending federal power into the South and the West, and also trying to determine who exactly were going to be citizens in this moment, right? Who was going to have citizenship rights uh, who was the federal government going to protect? Um, and to what extent would they protect the citizenship rights um, of all Americans uh, in both the South and the West? Uh, and then I also determined that really, you know, Americans are looking in this moment for something powerful to believe in. And one of the things they could believe in was this whole idea that America was nature's nation, that we may not have the, the great ruins of past you know, civilizations, although we did have them in the form of places like Mesa Verde, uh, which did not enter you know, the American consciousness for a little a couple more years uh, after this. But you know, we didn't have those kind of European storied past sort of uh, years, you know, thousands and thousands of years of history. Um, but America did have its amazing natural wonders. It had Niagara Falls. You know, it had Yosemite and Mariposa Grove, which the US government had given to the state of California to manage in 1864. Um, and then what they saw in Yellowstone was this completely unique place. What Hayden proved when he came out of there with all of his specimens and all of the photographs and the paintings of, of William Henry Jackson and Thomas Moran was that this was a place that was extraordinary and unique in all the world, right? Because other, other, lots of other places have very impressive waterfalls and mountain ranges, right? Um, but Yellowstone, the, that geothermal basin is the largest geothermal basin in the world by far. And I think Hayden wasn't sure of that yet, but I think he knew, like they knew, uh, Iceland was, people already knew about Iceland, they already knew about New Zealand. I'm not sure they knew about the geothermal fields of the Atacama in Chile yet, but uh, just the extent, the thousands and thousands of geysers and, and um, hot springs and mud pots, just, I mean, it was, it was phenomenal. And Hayden knew it was special. And, you know, in moments of crisis, we often look to something like that to give us hope, right? <laughs> to give us, yeah. or to just just believe in something. I mean, it it was sort of akin to me, like when um, we saw the landing of the Mars Perseverance, uh, right during the pandemic. 
I mean, I was nerding out about that because I was like, this is amazing and wonderful. And it was so fun to see all the scientists, you know, cheering and things actually <laughs> worked and, you know, it landed and we, we had all this amazing stuff. And I think, you know, that it was tracking the Yellowstone expedition and then learning about what Hayden discovered kind of had that kind of resonance. Um, yeah, collective pride. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like you could feel optimistic about something and just think it was really, uh, you know, wonderful that we were able to achieve something like this, right? Um, and of course, uh, well, and in this context, it came at great cost to Native peoples. Um, to most white Americans at the time, that was of no consequence. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you're you're mentioning, you know, as we're as we're chatting, your your research, which is a you know fairly small word. Um, and when one picks, picks up a history book, you know, you find that you've, you've read it by the time you're two thirds of the way through the pages, because mm -hmm. the, the pages are notes, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And, and it's sometimes easy as a reader to not think about how much work those notes actually comprise. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, what's, what's your favorite part of putting a book like this together? Are there, are there tedious parts involved? Um, what's, you know, a little bit of the, the process aspect of it? Oh, I, I really do love all the, the parts of it. I mean, the research component just sort of feeds that part of my brain that loves to learn new things. Um, and this is, you know, even though all four of my books share this interest in, in weird places, um, they are all completely different. And that's because, you know, I've never been a person who just said, okay, I'm going to write a book on this one topic. And then the second book will also be about that topic <laughs> in greater depth. Um, I always have wanted to, to just strike out in new directions and look at new and different things so I could learn a lot. And so the process of research for me is the process of learning and discovery. Um, and for this book, it was a little different because I, I started researching and writing it in the summer of 2019. Uh, and I really only took my first archival research trip in March of 2020. And in fact, two years ago today, wow. I got on a plane uh, from Washington, D.C. and came home uh, because I got kicked out of the National Archives um, one week into what was supposed to be a two week research trip to look at the Hayden survey records uh, because the great you know, benefit of researching a federal project is that it is all of those documents are saved uh, and they are at the National Archives in some form or another. Um, so uh, I feel really lucky actually that I had at least that one week. I was able to take a lot of photos and bring those home with me. Um, but that was my only archival time. That was my the only and for a historian, you know, that is it, it can be quite devastating. And also for an environmental historian like me, I like to go out to the places that I'm studying. And I like to walk through them. I go and I visit all of the places uh, and you know, make sure that, that I have a sense of that landscape. Because it's important to me also as a writer that I bring the reader onto the ground with the people. So I want you there with Hayden as he you know, walks through Omaha to go meet uh, his survey team members as they are assembling. You know, I want you there on the ground with Sitting Bull um, as he is, you know, engaged with battle, engaged in battle with Northern Pacific surveyor um, teams, and then also the the U.S. Army soldiers who are protecting them. You know, um, and I want you there with Cook as he's trying to figure out if he's going to, you know, fail in this investment of his. Um, and that means traveling to these places. And I wasn't able to do that because of the pandemic. Um, so I relied very heavily on digitized resources for the research for this book. Um, but, I, and so I actually, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of the people who have digitized primary document records um, that are in federal databases, that are, uh, you know, in places like newspapers.com, um, Happy Trust, uh, Google Books, <laughs> like all of these uh, sources were actually available to me, uh, which was remarkable. Um, and I was able to see all of, of William Henry Jackson's photographs. I was able to see all of Thomas Moran's paintings in detail. Um, oh, wow. 
because of uh, certain, you know, art sites that have made that possible. So, so that was really great. Um, but yes, I did. I did most of the research for my own living room, um, which, you know, it's weird to write a book about exploration from, from a chair, um, but it did actually kind of transport me um, to Yellowstone, which is kind of nice during the pandemic. I was able to kind of, if I couldn't go there in person, I could go there kind of in my imagination. Um, but I also really like the writing process too. I mean, there are parts of the production process that are a little, you know, when you are proofreading the text or, you know, the copy edits and you only have a couple of days to do it, that can get a little intense. And, and sure. proofreading notes is also very intense. <laughs> um, and you kick yourself, uh, your former self for not putting the complete note in the first time <laughs> that you did it. Um, but I have to say, I actually do. I'm one of those crazy people. I love revising. I love cutting. I, I write long and I cut and I love cutting material. Um, I'm very, I'm a remorseless murderer of my own words, <laughs> which I think a lot of people are like, what? <laughs> How could you do that? But, but I really, I really do love it. Um, and then to have, you know, the book come out fully formed and, and, uh, and, and to be able to hold it in my hands after it comes out, like, that's just, that's just amazing. And, you know, I really have to thank Scribner for, getting this book through uh, production, through all kinds of crazy labor shortages and material shortages uh, so we could get it out in time for, for Yellowstone's uh, 150th. Uh, it was, we were all working really, really hard uh, to do yeah. that. Um, but I see we do, we have another uh, question that's about um, the biggest threat to the preservation of Yellowstone today, uh, climate change. So we were, we were talking about, Alex and I were talking about this earlier um, because um, scientists at Montana State put out a, a climate impact report in July on the, Yellow, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So Yellowstone is kind of in the center of this much larger, um, nearly intact temperate zone ecosystem, which is one of the largest in the world. And so for scientists, it's just an amazing place <laughs> to do research, as Alex knows. Um, and, uh, and basically, the, the climate report's um, conclusions are, are not good. Um, they're, they're predicting that uh, the summers will be hotter. There will be less snowpack. Uh, instead of snow, there will be rain, which evaporates more quickly um, and doesn't lead to as much groundwater. Um, for the park in the region, what this means is probably uh, longer fire seasons, which changes the way that wildlife habitats work um, and changes the, the ecosystem profoundly in, you know, in all kinds of different ways. Um, and reducing kind of the water table and then also the, the amount of water in rivers like the snake in, in Alex's photo right there, um, the snake in the Yellowstone and the Green River um, and you know other smaller river systems are gonna get lower, which is you know a problem for the park and its animals, but also a problem for everyone who lives on the periphery of the park uh, in towns and on ranches and farms. Um, and then also the, the kind of the way that that's going to affect the park's geothermal features is kind of interesting um, because they're fed by groundwater. If you have less groundwater, then you have less water to build up uh, that heat and that steam and to explode out of the ground as geysers. So we may see some features disappear entirely. We may see uh, geysers um, kind of stop exploding on, on a regular basis um, or their period, you know, Old Faithful may start only kind of uh, going off every three or four hours instead of which, every few minutes. Yeah, which it got its name, right, from its regularity. Yes. And the time, you know, when Hayden was there, it was at about an hour. Um, so it is, it has been getting longer over time. Uh, but I, I think they're going, they're anticipating that there will be more extreme impacts there. Um, so yeah, the, the, the impact of climate change is already being felt and will continue um, if we do nothing about it, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah. So we're, we're almost out of time. Um, again, if, if there's any sort of last questions, try to put them in the Q&A box if you can. Um, Last call to the audience for questions. Um, 
I'll just, you know, sort of comment to your, you were saying earlier about your process and, and writing. Um, and it, it really shows, you know, all of your, the, the passion, the interest, um, the, the willingness to sort of trim and cut down and make a streamlined book, um, I think shows and how, and how engaging this book is and how well it's written. Um, it's, oh, good. it's not a textbook, um, but it's super engaging. Good. That's really, that's wonderful to hear because I, I really did want, it was important to me that readers really feel a sense of that landscape um, as people are moving through Yellowstone and then you know, moving in between DC and Yellowstone and DC and Philadelphia and um, South Carolina and all the places that, that appear in the book. So that's great to hear. Thank you so much. Thank you well, for writing it. If we have no more questions, thank you, Megan, and thank you, Alex, for leading such an inspiring conversation. Um, a reminder that copies of Saving Yellowstone are available at Oblong Books and also online at oblongbooks.com. Before I close for the evening, I'd like to extend our thanks to Abigail Novak and Scribner for helping make this event happen. And thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. I, we really hope you enjoyed it. And I wish you all a very good night. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Everybody, good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.